المكتب التعاوني للدعوة والإرشاد وتوعية الجاليات بالأحساء يا لا له يا لا لا لي 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 يا لا له يا لا لا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم علي وصحبه أجمعين برحمةك يا أرحم الراحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Ah, mashallah. A lot of young people here. Alhamdulillah. Now, this is excellent. This is wonderful. Uh, so, inshallah, we'll spend a couple of hours together this morning. And uh, I'll get to... Uh, um, do I need a microphone or is this fine? This is okay. But do you need uh, the other microphone? Or is you can... I mean, you're all close by, so I don't think uh, it's necessary. How's the volume there? It's okay? Yeah. Alright, alhamdulillah. So, we'll spend a couple of hours together, inshallah. Uh, I can't promise that I'll know all your names. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll somewhat know my name. My name is Muhammad, uh, last name Kadir. Uh, I'm originally from Kenya, but I spent uh, close to about 20 years of my life in North America. And I've been here in Bahrain for quite some time. I spent some time in Malaysia as well, uh, and in India. So, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, presently, I live here in Bahrain. And uh, the current role that I have here in Discover Islam, I'm the head of Discover Islam in the U.S., but I'm also uh, helping this organization here to restructure itself. So I've been appointed uh, by the board here to be a consultant and to reconfigure Discover Islam here in Bahrain. My background is marketing, which is what I'm going to share with you, inshallah. Uh, I've tried to use some business approaches to da'wah, this is the unique thing that we're talking about. So the session today, like you see in your program, I hope you all got a program, is uh, we'll start very briefly uh, talking about da'wah, uh, what it means to all of you. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more from a business standpoint in terms of a marketing approach. Uh, then we'll go on to uh, understanding our market, take a break, we'll understand our product. And finally, we'll have what I call the art of da'wah. So, uh, before we go on, I'd like to get to know all of you a little bit better. Excellent. Alhamdulillah. So, we have a uh, whole bunch of different students and a teacher, mashallah. Uh, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's so good to see young people like yourselves involved in this, and even younger people. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, we're hoping he even here in Discover Islam, we can get more young people involved. And I am... Honestly, I am so pleased to see you all, alhamdulillah. You know, may Allah reward you for taking this effort and coming here. But this is, uh, this is just wonderful, mashallah. Um, what, uh, what I want, uh, m the sessions that I do normally, uh, they can last one day, they can even last two days. The same session that you have in front of you can take up to two days to do. But what I'm going to try to do is crunch it down to uh, two, two and a half hours, all of it. And part of the reason we can do that, inshallah, is uh, that Brother Zuhair assured me that you're all professionals. Meaning, you are me, your students, you're fluent in English, you are quick on the uptake, you're, learn, you're, you're used to learning and all. So you'll be able to take in this information far better and process it far better. Uh, but don't worry about it. If it becomes a bit too much, Inshallah, in the next week, two weeks or so, I will give you notes to take with you and that you can use them yourself. So the first thing I'd like to ask you is, uh, can some of you uh, tell me or any one of you tell me, what do you understand by da'wah? What is da'wah? Since this is what we're talking about. Yes, brother. Uh, invite uh, non-Muslims to Islam. Okay. Uh, any other definitions? Um, okay. So, inviting uh, non-Muslims to Islam. Uh, outreach, reaching out to people. What else? Uh, how about converting? Converting, not really, no. Not really. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, convey the message. Convey the message. Are we here to convert? Our, our responsibility is to convey, not to convert. Alhamdulillah. Excellent. So, uh, give me some verses of the Quran that you're familiar with that talk about the the idea of da'wah. Right. What verse is that? Chapter or uh, surah? And uh, so Allah tells us in the Quran, this is the verse that you said, right? This is the one, right? Okay. So you're all very familiar with this. 
the verse before that, and there are many, many other verses. Um, so the, the, the idea behind reminding you of this is that uh, the work we're doing is very, very important work. It's work that is the work of the prophets, of uh, the messengers. It's the work of the Sahaba. And, and this is indeed, uh, if you could uh, pass this on. These are just some verses of the Quran and some hadith that relate to da'wah. Uh, what would be a very good exercise for you to do when you... Uh, are you staying in some hotel tonight? Yeah. No, okay. No, no, no. Or you're heading back. Yeah. But at some point in time in the course of the next few days, if you would make it a point to go and do some research. And these days, you can just Google it. It's as easy as that. Look up all the verses of the Quran that deal with da'wah. Some may be very, very different, uh, you know, very different from what you think they are. But when you read them, you'll understand how important this is. So this is from a Quranic perspective. We all believe, we all understand, and Allah tells us. So we say, we, uh, we listen and we obey. Then you have hadith. You have numerous hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that talk about the importance of da'wah. The entire life of the Prophet ﷺ was devoted to this. So yes. He والسلام, was a husband, a father, uh, a general, uh, a leader of the community. But his principal mission was to deliver the message of Islam. And by us taking on that responsibility on ourselves and doing it, we are doing the work of the prophets. This is indeed one of the highest categories of work that anybody can do. You know, you're training to be doctors, inshallah. Your job will be to save lives. Right? Sure. But that's only the physical body that you're saving. When the person dies, what happens? Allah knows best. You know, whatever Allah wills, Allah knows best what's going to happen. But the job of the prophets, the job of da'wah, is to try to bring people where their eternal life is saved. Not just this physical body that we have right now. That's your job right now. But the job of da'wah is even greater than that, and I'm sure you understand that that's why you're here today. But there's another component to it as well, and that component is the world that we live in today. The world we live in today, if you pick up any newspaper, you go to the internet, look up, uh, just type in Islam, and you'll get tons and tons of information out there. But most of that information is against Islam. On a daily basis, no less than a thousand articles, uh, video clips, uh, blogs, you name it, are written against Islam and Muslims. Every single day. In all the languages of the world. And it doesn't make a difference whether you're in Bahrain or in Saudi Arabia or anywhere else. You still have access to all this information. And sometimes, unfortunately, that information is also published in our local newspapers. Because frequently, the newspapers will just pick up an article from Associated Press or from Reuters and they will just reprint it without thinking as to what impact this has or how it deals with Muslims. This is a simple fact of the world we live in today. Now, uh, those of us who've been here a little bit longer can attest to this that uh, 20 years ago, it was a bit different. Yes, they would talk about Muslims as terrorists. They would talk about us in a negative light. But it would be shocking. It would be where Muslims would say, why are you saying this? 30 years ago, it was even more so shocking. 40 years ago, we were not even on the, on the, you know, on the horizon there. We were not in the limelight. Today, it's every day. And it's so much ingrained into the minds of people that sometimes when I'm boarding a plane and another Muslim brother is getting on and he looks a bit nervous and he's sweating and all, I get worried as to what he's going to do. I mean, look at how much they've brainwashed us to thinking that way. This is the reality of the world we live in. Now, can you imagine what it will be like when these young brothers are standing here and they are 40-something years old, inshallah. What will the world be like at that time if it continues in this direction? Will you be able to do da'wah? Will you be able to invite and educate people about Islam? That's the challenge. So it's not only that from the Qur'an and from hadith and from history 
and from all the Anbiya that have come before and all the Sahabas and all the comp uh, companions to the companions and all the great scholars in the last 1400 years that they have come. It is our responsibility today as well. So the first part of it is to understand why this is so important. The second is uh, what Allah tells us as to how, and this is what you pointed out earlier, that we should do with wisdom, with words that, that uplift people, that make people feel good about themselves and good about this way of life. And do not fight, do not argue, reason, discuss, but in a manner that is better. You know, the idea of reasoning is also to use our brains, to use our minds. You are going in a, you know, you're in a medical profession. Uh, you are in computers. I mean, in computers, uh, you can't make uh, any code. If it's one plus one, it'll always be two. It's not going to be three, four, or five. And this is true for any science that you're doing. So when you're talking about reason, this is what we're talking about. That, that when we reason with people, it has to be rational. It has to be grounded on facts. It cannot be something that we make up. This all we will talk about a lot more. This last part of the verse is very important. And this is the part that frequently we as people who are involved in da'wah, da'is, we frequently forget. Certainly your Lord knows best who strays from his path and who is guided. Can you tell me why this is very important? I mean, all of it is important, but why is that particularly important for us? Think about it. Why do you think that's particularly important? Yes. Because it depends on the hidayah. Who Allah guides. What else? Can somebody else tell me something else about it? Or yourself even. Think about it. What does it tell you personally as a da'i as to what your attitude should be? You, yes. ju you just have to convey the message and li leave the rest for Allah. Okay. Yes. Well, we human beings have a choice. Well, uh, so we just convey the message and it's their choice whether they embrace Islam or not. These are all correct answers. But there's something else also that I'm looking for that is in this verse. Certainly your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best who strays and who is guided. Think about that. Who strays and who is guided. Allah knows best who it is. Do we know? No. Does it mean that if I'm the one who's doing da'wah, if I'm the one who's inviting people to Islam and I'm saying, you should do this, you should not do it, this is what Islam is all about and everything. Do I know whether I'm on the right path or do, uh, does Allah know? Allah knows. I don't know. So Allah knows best who's on the right path and who's not. This is very important for us to understand because it should bring in us the idea of humility, being humble. That we do not know what will become of us. We do not know that maybe there is a bit of arrogance, you know, there is pride, kibr, riya, these sort of things are inside us. And when we are talking to somebody, we're looking down at that he's a kafir. You know, he doesn't know about Islam. Look at this man, you know, maybe, maybe in the back of our mind there's little whisperings like that. That this person is worse than us. So we have to be very careful. And this part is, is a very important reminder that yes, reason with people. Use the best speech, the best way of uh, discussing. But also at the same time, keep yourself in check. That I am not somebody big. I don't know what's going to become of me. So how can I tell that I'm better than this person that I'm talking to? And this part of the message is frequently forgotten. But this is probably one of the most important parts of the message. As a da'i, somebody who is inviting others to this deen, you have to have that understanding. That humility is very important. So moving on. I'll quickly go through this because like I said, mashallah, you're all quite familiar with this. What do I mean by a marketing approach? Well, first, marketing 101. Those of you who are in, uh, in university would be familiar that most of the courses that you take, the first course you take is 101. In the university, the one represents the, the first year that you're in, and 101 is the, the, the first portion, the introduction to that particular course. The basic things. The very basic, right. So marketing 101 is what we're talking about. Nothing complicated, nothing beyond what uh, sometimes is even taught in high school, but most of the times is taught in first year university. If you're doing a bachelor's degree in business or commerce, that's what they will teach you in marketing. Uh, if you're doing an MBA, this is going to be the first course that they're going to teach you in marketing. So I'm going to give you that in a very, very small nutshell. So all we're talking about is market versus product. What do you understand by what is a market? What is a market? 
What is a product? You familiar with these terms? Sure you all are, because we live in a, a community where we are surrounded by the market. You can call it a souk, but market in its most general terms means any group of people, any group of buyers, anybody who is going to buy your product. In your case, your market might be your patients. Right? In your case, maybe your market is some client who needs uh, uh, software installed or programming done, or in case you're in hardware, it might mean selling the hardware. That's your market. In your case, your market students. is your students. Yeah. Right? It could also be your market is your parents. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. yeah. So depending on, and for, for, for you all who are still students and have not thought, maybe you are already doing some business in some way or the other. But we are constantly in a market. Sometimes you've got to market your ideas to your parents. Maybe you want the latest Xbox, you know, or maybe you want to uh, get uh, uh, extra money for, for something. Uh, I don't know, maybe a, a new football or something like that. Some new outfit that you want to play games, right? You need to market yourself to your parents. You go and convince them, you know, please, uh, all the other kids have it, that kind of thing, whatever, however you do it. But the point is, they are your market at that time. What's the product you're selling? In your case, the product you're selling is the services that you have. You know, as medical professionals, you're providing a service. And unfortunately for you, uh, and unfortunately for your parents, I mean your patients, that service is going to be always needed, right? But that's a service you're providing. So your product, in our case, now, now take all these ideas and you know, apply them to Islam and Da'wah and all. So in that case, what is our market and what is our product? So first, what is our product? What's the product we're selling? Islam. 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 Now the question is, uh, when you think of your product as Islam, um, how, how do you think of it as a product? Tell me. As a way of life. Okay. Anything else? Have you ever thought of Islam as a product? Maybe it doesn't expire. So okay. Because uh, you can think of it as a product or a service. However, the general terms in marketing are always product versus market. So what I want you to do is think for a moment about Islam as a product. If you were somebody who, whose job is to market this, what would you look for in a product? So for example, uh, if I look at this chair, and I want to try to market this chair, I will look at what the features are. And I will try to show my market what is amazing about this chair. What are the unique features about this chair? What is it that makes this chair better than that chair? So the same way you've got to look at the product being Islam, and you've got to think, okay, what is it that makes this a unique product, a special product? So you need to look at the attributes of the product, the features of the product. Fair enough? Yeah. That's how you identify the, uh, the product. Now what about market? In our case, what would the market be? What would your market be? Humanity. This is if you're a doctor, it's patients. Mm -hmm. About Islam, what would your market be? Humanity. Humanity. All of humanity. Excellent. But now we will go later on and we will look at it from a different angle, how you take your market and you understand it better. Um, so, if you're in Saudi Arabia, uh, what town are you in? Ahsa. Ahsa. How big is Ahsa? Bahrain. Maybe as big as Bahrain. As big as Bahrain. Yeah. So, we will talk a little bit more about how you look at your market, Ahsa, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as part of the Khadij, the Gulf, as part of the whole world, inshallah. In order to do that, you need to do some market research and some product research. Because you know your product, yeah. You practice it. You are a Muslim, right? But when you're dealing with a particular market, if you go, for example, let's say to France, and you are in Lyon, and you want to do da'wah to the non-Muslims there, are you going to do it in Arabic? No. Or do it in French? That's how you know your market. You know that your market is French speaking, so you need to learn, learn French. But now, what about your product? How will you customize your product to reach out to them? You have to think, oh, these are people of the book. Many of them, some of them may have left their deen and become atheists or agnostics. 
So you, if you understand your market, you can then look at the features of your product and market those features that are best suited to that market. So this is where you need to do product research as well. You need to know what your product is all about. Not just what you are practicing, but what would be applicable to that market. In order to do this, in order to understand our product and our market, we need to do what many of you might be familiar with, a SWOT analysis. This is typical whenever you're doing any kind of planning, whenever you want to figure out where you are, you do a SWOT or a situational analysis. Uh, so let's talk about the product itself. What is so special about this product? What are our strengths? I've put them up there, but you try to tell me, based on that and your own experience, what's so special about Islam? Well, I think because uh, uh, monotheism and getting away from that paganism, um, uh, the lower creatures become God. I think maybe this is something interesting for people who... Why? Uh, because uh, it involves, like, uh, I like some, some uh, Muslim uh, preachers, they put it to, like, uh, they link the proof for God or the proof of existence of God by the, the theory of the Big Bang. So that's something okay. scientific, that's something... Uh, that's using reason? Yeah, that's okay. reasoning. I okay. think uh, by this way, yeah. uh, we can grasp some people who are the people who are admirers of science, the people who are following the... Now here you're going into methodology. Yeah, what I'm talking about here, uh, what I'm asking here is why is it a fantastic product? Reason? Because it's a... Uh, what's the word? Do you know humble? Yeah. Mystery. Uh, yeah, it's kind of mystery because it, almost in all religions, or most of them, they, they see what they are worshipping. For right. example, Buddha or whatever, or even yeah. Christianity, they have that cross. Right. But in our case, we, we're worshipping somebody who we do not see. So that's the kind of mystery to them. So it's kind of fantastic. Could be. That's one way of looking at it. Yes, brother. It's free for everyone. Like anyone can join Islam. Okay. Okay. Um, even more fundamental than that, right? Is who has created us? Allah has created us, right? Um, if I if I uh, put together, let's say, okay. Right. I have a phone here, Samsung, Apple, whatever it is. Okay, I'm the one who's manufactured this phone. Who knows this phone better? I'm the one who knows it best. So Allah has created us. Who knows us best? Allah knows us best. So Allah has created a manual for us. That manual is the Quran. Allah has created a sales force for us to explain the features of this. Those are the prophets that came. They are the ones who showed us how to use that product. So the product is fantastic because it is it is created by the ultimate creator. I may make a, a, you know, a, a book, I may make a bottle, I may make a chair, but I am not perfect. None of us are. Allah is perfect. And Allah is the one that has created this product for the best of creation. This is what makes this product so fantastic. There are no errors in this product. The product is the only the only thing that exists that is perfect. Human beings are imperfect. We are imperfect. Everything else around us is imperfect. But this deen that Allah has given us is perfect. There is nothing in this deen that is not perfection. Because it is directly from Allah meant for us. That is what makes this product so fantastic. Um, the, the other items I've put there are that uh, we have the human resources. We talk about, you know, 1.3, 1.5, 1.6, 1 1.7 billion people around the world. We have the financial resources. Some of the wealthiest people in the world are Muslim. Right? Um, and I would like you to think along the lines of what are the other strengths we have. There are many. But above all, help is guaranteed from Allah. If we do this work right. With the sincerest of intentions. The weakness that we have, and there are many weaknesses we have. The first is the same large number of people we're talking about, 1.6, 1.7 billion people around the world. We're weak. We're not all good users of this product. 
we don't use it well, we don't practice it well, we don't bring it totally as part of our lives, and how are we going to go and then invite people to this way of life? Um, we don't use wisdom. We say everything sometimes, we say nothing sometimes, we say the wrong things. Um, in terms of uh, the divisions we have within us, all the different sects we have, you know, uh, how we want to divide. Oh, you believe in this, this is an Akida issue, you know, you are not part of this thing, you are different from me, that sort of thing. Then you look at our resources that we have, whether human or financial, how well are we utilizing them? Uh, lastly, ignorance. And, I, and I've, this is not a misprint, it's not what is Islam, it is what Islam. Because there are so many versions of Islam that are out there. You know, right now we have this whole movement going on, you know, political, military movement, Daesh, uh, ISIS and all. What version of Islam is that? The country you come from, there's another version of Islam. You go from your home country and there's another version of Islam. And there's divisions there. One group of people fighting another group of people. You go to different parts of Africa, same thing. You go to America, same thing. You go to Europe, same thing. All parts of the world, we've got so many divisions amongst us. So what Islam are we talking about? Do we have one Islam that we're talking about? Or are there many Islams? Islam has to be one only. This is from Allah. The Quran is one. Then how can we have so many groups of people, each one saying they are right and everybody else is wrong? And that's what's so unique about every one of these groups. That every one of these groups sincerely believes that they are the only ones who are right and everybody else is wrong. And unfortunately, many of those groups, I came across a very interesting thing that uh, a lot of these sects, they call one another kafir. And it is the kafirs out there who call us all Muslim. Think about how interesting that is. We call one another kafir. But it's the outsiders who look at us and group us all as one and call us Muslims. And then we have to say, no, 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 I'm not like that person. I'm like this person. No, no, I'm not like this. We don't believe in this. We believe in this. And we are constantly defending our position. We're saying, okay, that group is different from us. We are different. So think about this. Uh, because it's a, it's a very big weakness that we have. Now what about in terms of uh, uh, the OT part, opportunities and threats? Opportunities. There's a huge vacuum out there. There is, uh, you know, on, on a daily basis, if you look around and you talk to people, people that you meet, non-Muslims, many of them have a great need for something in their life. They need purpose. Every human being needs purpose. You get to a point in your life, you're saying, what is this all about? Why am I here? You know, is it all about just eating, drinking, going to the bathroom, sleeping? Is this what life is all about? Or is there more to it? So there's a huge vacuum, a spiritual vacuum. And there are no answers. Most other faiths don't give an answer that is sufficient. So there's very little competition. There's no real competition out there. So that's a huge opportunity that we have. The second is world events. Whether we like it or not, for whatever reasons it is, but there are constantly events going on around the world. Constantly. So yesterday, what was it? This group of people destroying statues, you know, that are predating Islam, hundreds if not thousands of years old. It becomes a big thing. YouTube links and goes viral all, all over the world. And the media has picked it up and talking about how these so-called Muslims are destroying humanity, the culture of humanity, the history that we have. And they relate it to Islam. And they're related to the Prophet ﷺ. So now we have an opportunity. It's a world event. It's a bad event. But it's still an event where somebody will talk to you. So what do you think about this? These guys are doing these things in the name of your religion. That's a world event. And they're constantly world events every day. The third is we still have the freedom to invite. We still have, in the country that you come from, here in Bahrain, in different parts of the world, there is still freedom to invite people to this way of life. There were times, you know, you look at uh, a couple of hundred years ago, uh, back in the 15th century, the Spanish Inquisition uh, in, in parts of Europe, where uh, the Catholic Church took over pretty much, Muslims would not be allowed to practice their faith. Leave alone invite people to Islam. They were in a state where uh, they would sometimes not go to sleep at night 
to just hold their wudu so that they could pray and they would pray in secret. But that was a couple of centuries ago. Even right now, you go to China, many parts of China, you cannot do that. Huh? You go to uh, some of the former Soviet republics, the same thing. All right. Um, sometimes that is clearly there. Sometimes it's very hidden. You go to parts of America or, or generally North America, you go to Europe and doing that way is very difficult. But still, alhamdulillah, there is to some extent freedom. What about the threats? These same world events we talked about could be world events that lead to more and more restrictions on us doing this work. If we are seen as a threat, people will shut us down. The more successful you become, the more you become a threat to people who want the world to remain the way it is, who want to continue uh, oppressing people and taking advantage of people. The majority of the world is oppressed. Even if you have the freedom to earn money and everything, the majority of the world is oppressed. Economically, there's very few people that benefit around the world. Very few people. A few weeks ago, a study came out by Forbes that 1% uh, uh, of the world owns more than 90-something percent of the world. They own more. You take that, I think it was the top 93 people, the wealthiest people, the top 93 individuals. And they own more than half the world's wealth. More than half the world's wealth is owned by such few people. Think about it for a moment, how scary that is. Now those people, do you think they want to let go? So what do you tell a child in Africa who's starving? Too bad, you die. Allah is guaranteed that he's not going to, he's going to give us risk, all of us. So how come there are people dying in Africa, in Asia, in South America? From starvation, from lack of food. Why? Because others have a lot more. If 93 people, less than 100 people can own half the world's wealth, what a world we live in. What a horrible world we live in. So these are all, you know, issues that are slowly closing and they are big threats. The other one is what is called Islamophobia. You might have come across this. There is a growing anti-Islamic trend out there. When I said earlier, over a thousand articles and magazines and uh, video clips and everything on a daily basis, that's a small number. It's growing. It's becoming bigger and bigger. And this is what I mean by Islamophobia. Attacks against Islam. And they will attack the most fundamental things that we hold dear to us. So they will attack the Prophet They will attack the Quran. They will attack the values that we stand on. And they will attack in every way they can. Now this is not something new. The shaitan has promised. Iblis has promised from the beginning. That he's going to lead humanity astray. So it's not that it's any different. It's just that now with the way the world is. And how we are connected with one another. And how easy it is. Something that I'm saying right now. You can record it right now. And within a few seconds. Everybody in the world can know about what I'm saying. That's a scary amount of power that each individual holds. And yet at the same time, the bulk of it is used against Islam. So this is what's going on. And the other one is all these isms that are there. Terrorism, extremism, nationalism. These are ways in which we are divided constantly. Constantly divided, divided, divided and all. And kept away from what the purpose of our life is. Moving on. What I call the STPs. Again, we're talking about marketing. So we take a market, any market. So let's say, for example, I'm not very familiar with your market. You tell me, how big is your city? Ahsa, how big is it? It's quite large, like as, most, uh, as, as, as big as Bahrain, right? Can you, as a group of 10, 12, 15 people, can you reach out to everybody there? Can you deliver the message to everybody? You'll, you'll need to segment it. You'd need to break it down. So think of it like a big pizza pie. Think of it as a big pizza. You ordered a big pizza. Amongst all of us, let's say we ordered the biggest pizza we could find. It's like a 25 inch pizza. Right? Big like a, about a meter wide. Huge big pizza. Right? And you said, okay, I'm going to eat this pizza. Are you going to take the whole thing and stuff it in your mouth? Maybe some of you can, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe tough, right? What you need to do is cut it. 
Break it into smaller pieces. So you will segment it. You will divide it into smaller portions. Something that you can take into your mouth. That's what is meant by segment. Divide the market. Then you will target yourself into that particular segment. So once you've divided the pizza into different slices, now you're going to say, okay, that is my slice. I'm going to go for that slice. Nobody else go for that slice. That's my slice. I'm going for it. So you're not targeting that particular slice that you've gone for. So that market you have, you've targeted that market. Now you're going to position yourself to eat. You can grab the pizza, put it to your mouth and take it in. So the same applies to the market we are. You need to position yourself in that market. How are you going to reach into that market? That segment that you've targeted, now you're going to position yourself in that. Moving on. Let's talk a little bit about the different ways. Direct versus indirect da'wah. Okay. Direct da'wah, you're like salespeople. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. You know, you go to a store and somebody is trying to sell you something. You go to a mobile store and the person behind the counter there is telling you, no, this phone is better. He's trying to get you to buy the most expensive phone he can. So he's a salesperson there. So you are da'is, you're a sales force. When you meet somebody, either in your school, in your university, in the market, wherever you are, you are that salesperson delivering that message of Islam. You're selling that product. So it's either one-on-one -on -one or you're dealing with a large group of people. Maybe you're talking to several people at the same time. Um, it could be at different events that you organize as a, uh, as a group of people. And then you have indirect, where you use some kind of medium to deliver the message. So it may be uh, books that you use, it may be a pamphlet, uh, it may be a website, it may be WhatsApp messages, maybe Twitter, Instagram. These are all different kinds of media that you use to deliver the message of Islam. They could be of two kinds. One is where you get it for free. So you're not paying for it. The other one is that you have to pay for it. For example, you take a newspaper, place an ad in it, you've got to pay for that ad to place there. So these are different ways in which you may be doing da'wah. Again, looking at it from a marketing standpoint. And this pretty much in a very small way, in a very quick way, marketing 101 is what a marketing approach to DAO is all about. So, before we go on, any questions? Told you it's going to be very easy. Yeah. Yes. No, no, I mean okay, uh, alhamdulillah. Yes, brother. Uh, can you read the STP? Yeah, segment, target, and position. Segment is take that big pizza pie, break it into smaller portions so that you can eat it. Target is where you go for that one particular portion that you want and then position yourself how best to attack that particular market. Yes, well, brother. As, uh, as we uh, are sales, salesmen, yes. we should always be thoughtful about our products. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Unlike, unlike any other product that we're doing out there, in this particular case, there's no question uh, about the truthfulness of what we're doing. Yes, I mean, uh, think about it for a moment. Uh, the product you're selling in of itself is truth, right? If, if I tell people that you should always be honest and I'm not honest about it, there's a problem there, right? Okay, um, the third session, so we've already covered the first two sessions in your program, if you look at it. The third session we have is understanding the market. And in this particular part of the workshop, is where you will do the work and I will watch you. So I want you to analyze and I'll give you um, some markers, hopefully they work, and a whiteboard there. And I would like one of you to take charge of this. Yes, brother. <laughs> okay, the markers work fine. Okay, why don't we do this? I'm going to ask you questions and you'll fill in the, uh, the gaps, okay? So, this part of the workshop is very easy. It's going to maybe take another 10 minutes and then we'll take a break for coffee and all that. So, in these 10 minutes, I want to know everything I can about your market. Fair enough? Yeah. So, first, what is your market? Tell me. Okay. Okay, so let's put this down. Humanity. Somebody else says tourists. Okay. 
figure out or just an hour tour in the mosque? Okay, it all depends how you want to do it. You see, we, we talked about your pizza pie. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to define your pizza as being? That's up to you, how you define your pizza. Right? It is entirely up to you how you define it. So, you need to tell me what you're going to start with as your definition of your pizza. And maybe you want, you want to direct the camera this way. So, what's that pizza going to be? Is it going to be the mosque? Maybe co-workers. As a group, I would imagine that you are working together as a group. Or you've come here uh, as a group. So tell me, what is your market? Can we say your city? Yeah. Okay. How do you spell it? A-H-S-A? Yes. Is it Al-Ahsa or Ahsa? Al-Ahsa. No problem. It's all correct. Okay. So this is the name of your city. So this is a city? Tell me more about this city. How many people live here? So is it a million or two million? Two million. Which one of you is right? Can anybody else give me another number? We're holding an auction here. They just love their city, so they want to make it a big deal. Just a million. Okay, you're saying it's a million, you're saying it's two million. Because I predict it make it one million fifty. Let's just say approximately a million. Because the city is still growing. Okay, so we can say it's between one million to two million people. Roughly. Maybe one and a half million. Right? Okay. Now, does that tell you something already about your city? About how much you know about your own city? Yeah, we know really not that much. Aha! You see, because you have disagreement here as to whether it's a million or two million people, back to what we said earlier, market research. You need to know your market. And apparently, you don't know your market. I mean, this is your city. You live in this city. Some of you have been born in this city, maybe, right? Okay, how well do you know your city? How many people live in this city? Right? You need to know what your market is all about. So the first thing we start with is how many people? Because we're dealing with people. We're reaching out to people. So when we talked about the pizza being, you know, 25 inches, we need to know how big is that pizza in the first place. I want to feed, we want to feed all of us here. I say, okay, well, let's uh, call Papa John's and order pizzas. So how many pizzas are we going to order? We need to know how many to order. If I don't know how many people are here, how am I going to order how many pizzas, right? So we need to know how big that pizza is. So one to two million people. Now, who are these people? How many men? How many women? Okay, do you know? Almost half, half because uh, the Saudi Arabia population is 51% uh, men and 41, 45 49 women. So, 51% versus 49%. So some of the brothers are not going to get wives, right? <laughs> okay. So, the population is roughly half. Half men, half women. Okay, what about age? Age? We mostly youngsters. Yeah, the majority are youth. Majority are youth. So how would you define youth? Under the age of 20? So, so if, if, if you were to graph it, number of people here and age here, right, would you get a curve like this or would you get a curve like that? What kind of curve would you get? So that you say the majority of people here are between 20 and 30. Or is it the majority of people here between uh, 40 and 50. No, I think uh, from 13 to 38. Okay, so you see why, why is this important? Uh, why is this important? Because to know how, which, uh, uh, who, who you are dealing with and what technique you use. Okay, why? Because, if, for example, you, can, you cannot use something uh, that usually used with kids to invite all people. Exactly. Now we're talking about segmenting, targeting and position yourself. We're talking about positioning. Mm -hmm. How you position yourself. Because the way you will talk to sisters about Islam is very different than what you'll talk to brothers. Not everything, but some things will be different. The way you may talk to a 17 year old about Islam may be very different than what you talk to a 70 year old about Islam. 
your approach will change depending on which market you're reaching out to. But you need to know what your market is. Yes, brother. Uh, excuse me, but maybe, uh, I mean, the whole two million are not our market because like ah. the, 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 the uh, most of them are Muslims. They are already Muslims. Okay, they, they already so Muslims. now, so now you're asking very, very important questions, which we should get into. So, okay, we know about gender, we know about age. What else do we need to know about this market? Very important question. What? Muslims and non-Muslims. Yes, exactly. So, so now you've identified Muslim versus non-Muslim. Maybe this was the first question to ask. Right? Because if we're doing da'wah and we're inviting people to Islam, yeah, a lot of Muslims also need that invitation. But generally we would say that our market is the non-Muslim market. Those who are not Muslim. I'd like to call people of other faiths. That's a better way of saying it as opposed to none, but that's fine. You can say non-Muslim, right? People who are not Muslim. That's the market we're reaching out to. So we need to figure out what is that population. So out of the one million people, let's make our numbers simple and say it's a million. Just for, for today's argument. It may be more, one and a half, 1.8, whatever it is, but let's say it's a million. Out of the million people, how many are non-Muslims? Maybe 90% Muslim. 90% are Muslim? I think it's more than that, maybe 95. 95% Muslim. 98% so, Muslim. <laughs> Slowly we're going to get to a point where we don't even have a market. <laughs> so we're saying, right now, this is the entire population, which is let's say a million people. We're saying right now a population that we're reaching out to. That's our tiny little slice that we want to reach out to. So that's what, maybe 50,000 people? Fair enough? Yeah, less than that, I think, anyway. Okay, what number? Give me a number. 30,000 people? Yes. yes. Wow. We're making your job much easier, aren't we? 20,000, maybe 10,000? No, I think it's 20. Okay. 20, So, now, you have only 20,000 people to reach you. You know, you guys, by the end of this year, all these people should know about Islam. You have absolutely no reason that these 20,000 should not know about Islam. So maybe you can even set a goal right now. That your goal is, uh, by the end of 2015, or let's make it easier, by the end of 2016, every single non-Muslim in that city should know about Islam. There's no reason why not. That's a very, very small so number. Reach them? That's what we're going to get to in a short while. But first you need to know who they are, right? But, but the, these uh, 20,000 20, are not fixed. Some of them will leave, some of them will come. Okay, so it is a transient population. It comes and goes. Okay, fine, but still roughly about 20,000. Now, of these 20,000, who are they? Do you know more about them? Work, work, are they men, women? Workers, women, yeah. yeah. Mostly okay. men. Mostly men. So you could say maybe 95% men? 98%. 98% men? No, no, no. I think, uh, uh, how about the housemaid? Okay, so maybe it's less. Maybe it's 90% men. Okay, so let's say 90% men and let's say 10%. For, for our sake right now, for this discussion, we'll say 90% men, 10% women. Now, of these 90% men, what languages do they speak? Surely many of them do speak a little bit of Arabic. English. 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 The, majority the majority is English. Yeah. Okay, good. How many? Indian. So. 18,000 men, out of the 18,000 men, how many actually speak fluent English? Maybe not few. Not, not, not fluent, but 20, 20, 20 So you need to know what language do they speak. Because that's how you're going to communicate them. You need to know what age group they are, so you know how to talk to them. You need to know what education level they are at. So if you have an idea of their education, you can talk to them at that, l at that level. Yes. Education. What else? Can you tell me other things that you need to know about them? Social state. Social status. Okay, what else? Uh, background. Background meaning what? The religion. Culture. Religion. religion. Okay, very, very important. How come we forgot that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is their religion? Why is that important? Because there are Christians. I think it's easy. There, are, there is a kind of 
just relationship. Right, so religion, very important. We need to know what religion they are. Or even if they have a religion or not. It's very, very important. Uh, let's say you meet a, a, a Christian and you start saying, you know, I know a lot about Mary, the mother of Jesus and all. I should talk to him about uh, how the Quran says that uh, uh, Mary was a virgin, that no man had touched her that the angels approached her and, and the entire in Surah Maryam how it is related and all I should talk to this person because the person will be so impressed about Islam, right? Yeah. Do you think you should do that with every Christian? No. Why not? Because uh, not every Christian is a real Christian. Okay, what else? Denomination and their thinking. So how is it different? So you need to know, why do you need to know which denomination? Let's take the, uh, the issue of Mary, the mother of Jesus, alayhi yeah. salam. Yeah. Right? Okay, what is the difference between the two? Well, well, Let's say regarding Mary, the mother of Jesus. Yeah, for Mary, for example, the Catholic, right? she's almost a god, almost. Okay. But like, other types, maybe she's not that high, so maybe we okay. can focus on other things. Right. In addition to that, many Protestants do not believe in the, the virgin birth. They don't believe in that miracle. Whereas many Catholics not only believe in the virgin birth, but they also believe that Mary herself is a god. Uh, not just a god or a goddess, but that her birth was also miraculous. Not just the birth of Jesus. They believe in the Annunciation of Mary, which is another term altogether, and it comes before that. So that's also part of it. So if you're dealing with a Catholic, it's a very different conversation you'll have than if you're dealing with a Protestant. Now. If you did not know that the person is Christian and all, and you want to go and talk to them about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and it turns out the person is Buddhist or a Hindu. They don't care. Right. Why are you talking to them about that? So it's very important that we know the religion. What else is important that we need to know about these people that we're reaching out to? Language, age, gender, religion, all these things, education. Anything else you think? And there are many other ways. So I, I don't need you to answer that right now because we're trying to move a little faster. But I want you to think about it. That your market, you need to understand your market. And when you look at your city, which you live in, and some of you may have been born there, how well do you know your city? How well do you know your market? You need to fully define your market as best as you can. Because when you understand the people that you're reaching out to, only then will you be able to effectively deliver the product as they want it. And we'll talk more after the break about the market, the product, and how you deliver that message. That's going to be the next part. So we'll take a break right now.